Okay, let's get started. Uh, we're glad you're with us, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be here today. I'm Lori Ward. I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. The fund is the official philanthropic partner for Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Our staff and our board work really hard and really closely with the park superintendents and leadership teams as we set out to raise funds throughout the year for the, the park's top priority projects. This past year, we literally had our best year ever and just very excited to offer support to all three parks in some significant ways. We also are growing the endowment to another priority for our national parks. And today they stand collectively at 1.7 million. So some good su success there. Before we start, um, I'm gonna do a few housekeeping tips if I could. Um, our virtual field trip will last up to 45 minutes. Um, our friends will be giving us a presentation that will go for 30 minutes. As you have questions, please enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom and uh, we'll work our way through those when we, when we begin wrapping up. Um, this is clo has closed captioning enabled and uh, you can access that at the bottom. Uh, as we make these field trips more accessible, we are always open to suggestions. So please, if you have some, reach out to us. With that, I'm gonna introduce a very good friend of mine who I've known for 10 years. Uh, we go way back and every time we get together, we just kind of giggle a lot and it's fun. Rebecca Lofgren has been a scientist at Mount Rainier National Park for over 20 years. She began her career at Mount Rainier as a field lead with the inventory and monitoring program, conducting long-term ecological monitoring on the mountain lakes, the glaciers, the climate and air quality. Her role shifted in 2015 as she started uh, to lead the program for aquatics. That's where she is specializing today. She feels very fortunate for her career at Mount Rainier, where she met her husband, who also is a dear friend, and together they've raised their now 13-year-old daughter, I can't believe that, Rebecca, and spend um, endless days exploring Mount Rainier National Park as a family. And with that, I turn it over to you, Rebecca. Hi and welcome, thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that introduction. I'm gonna go ahead here and share my screen if you'll let me know when that pops up. Looks good. Yep. Great. Have to go. Yeah, so thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about what's going on in the aquatics program at Mount Rainier um, and for all the continued support over the years. My main goals really for today are to provide a quick overview of our program. Um, and it's really focusing on fish and amphibians in this talk. And I'll also touch on the habitat they live in. Um, I wanna describe some of the field techniques we're using to collect um, information to both learn and track trends about these resources. And then um, also provide some examples of actually active management we're doing to try and protect these native species. Um, and I think maybe most importantly, I'll share some opportunities on how you can help and join us in the field and meet us. We also have Matt Larson joining us, who's the field lead for fisheries in the park. Um, and I might tag him a bit for any questions at the end that you may have, because he's a wealth of knowledge as well. So with that, we'll get right into it. Um, you are all aware that Mount Rainier is dominated by water, all forms, frozen, moving, um, still. We have approximately 470 mapped rivers and streams, over 380 mapped lakes and ponds, and more than 3,000 acres of wetlands. It's the largest single mountain glacial system in the contiguous 48 states with 25 major glaciers. And of course, these, these glaciers feed the headwaters for the major rivers in the park. Um, notably, park waters are critical habitat for several native amphibian and fish species, including those listed as endangered, threatened, or species of concern, which I'll get into a little bit. We have endless waterfalls. I'm sure you have found them. Um, we even have mineral springs. You know, I think 
we all know water is a primary force of change at Mount Rainier. And I think this, this picture really just describes um, what I was discussing earlier. This is the White River watershed with the mighty, mighty Immens Glacier. Um, huge amount of water, frozen and moving. There's even a lake in one of the summit caves at Mount Rainier. Um, this, this picture also just demonstrates the connection between glaciers and streams and watersheds in the park. And so moving on to more of a map-based view of, of watersheds in the park, um, there are nine major watersheds in the park, which are you know, important source of water for the Puget Sound. And for those of you that don't know, all watersheds with the exception of the Cowlitz and the Ohanapakash drain to the Puget Sound, the Cowlitz and Ohana drains um, to the Columbia. And on this map, I've denoted in red, critical, designated critical habitat for um, the bull trout, which is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act that really relies on the cold water that's present in Mount Rainier National Park. And I'll get into that, that species a little bit more too. Notably, all rivers with the exception of the carbon that's highlighted here in green are blocked by at least one dam. Um, and these dams have a variety of ways to move fish around, either by ladders or even a, a trap and haul system where they're moved around by a truck. So clearly, clearly a stress to, to resources in the park. So getting into the why of the matter, why fish matter. And I think, you know, for everyone, everyone has a reason um, to themselves why fish matter. But in my mind, I've kind of clumped them into three categories. And, and really the first being they're indicators of stream health. Um, they require cold, clean water um, and complex connected habitats, especially the salmon in the Pacific Northwest. They require thriving macroinvertebrate com communities that live in the stream. And we, you know, when, when fish populations aren't thriving, we know that something bigger is probably going on. Second, I would say in one of the most enjoyable parts of, of my job is that fish cross boundaries and they motivate partnerships. You know, they do not stay in an isolated system. And because they cross boundaries, they bring partners together to really try and solve these really complex watershed issues. And then finally, fish are ecologically, culturally, and economically important. Um, while the park doesn't have extensive salmon habitat, it does, like I mentioned, provide the headwaters to the nine major watersheds that support large salmon runs, include you know, Chum, Sockeye, Chinook, Coho, Steelhead, all downstream. So getting into what we have in the park, you know, if you're walking around the park, the most common fish you'll likely encounter in the park is actually the cutthroat trout, the resident form of it. We also have rainbow trout um, in the park, but the species that I mentioned that's, that's really quite special to Mount Rainier and that gets a lot of attention um, is the bull trout. And these are federally listed species. They're threatened under the Endangered Species Act that require cold water and complex water and connected habitats. Um, so monitoring and protecting these species is a priority within the park. And because we hold such a core cold water reservoir that's likely and hopefully to persist um, through climate change. Other species include Chinook, Pink, and Coho. Um, while in less abundance and closer to the park boundary, um, they are in the park. We also have a few less well-known fish like the mountain whitefish, which is actually a really cool fish, and um, sculpin. Moving into the non-native fish world, we um, also host a number of non-native fish species that were introduced primarily through the result of stocking. And uh, within park streams, the most concerning fish is actually the brook trout, um, which has really similar habitat requirements to the bull trout. Um, and it's known to hybridize with bull trout and can even outcompete bull trout in certain conditions. They tend to tolerate slightly warmer temperatures. And so in these um, scenarios can outcompete bull trout in their habitat. So the overlapping presence of brook trout and bull trout in the park is um, a high priority for the park. Um, in our mountain lakes, brook trout tend to overreproduce and become stunted and really abundant um, in lakes as well. So just diving a little bit into the stocking, um, between the 1950s and 1970s, over 9 million 
fish were stocked into park water, similar to what was going on in the United States to support recreation fish, recreational fishing. Um, but this includes streams as well as um, a large number of the parks uh, lakes, which are historically, all of them historically fishless. So though stocking ended decades ago um, in the 1970s, we still have naturally reproducing populations in both streams and also in about 35 mountain lakes in the park. I'm just showing some historic pictures that on the right, for those of you that I know have hiked in the Palisades area, um, Sunrise Lake, there's the stock train and also near Eagle Peak um, Trail. So the reality with, with with fish that have been stocked in historically fishless um, lakes is that we know they have altered aquatic ecosystems. They replace amphibians as the top predator and they alter the food web. Um, we've documented amphibian behavior changes, abundance changes, um, and for many species declines in those areas. So for a place like Mount Rainier, it's, it's particularly concerning in the context of climate change. Um, as we know, studies have shown many of the currently fishless shallow lakes that support amphibians um, for habitat are projected to dry. And many of the deep water lakes that currently have fish and could provide potential refuge for amphibians, um, fish already occupy that, that top um, niche. And then, you know, getting into amphibians and kind of why, why we care about this species as well in the context of this conversation. We have 14 species of amphibians in the park, including nine salamanders and um, five frogs, actually four frogs and one toad. Um, but most amphibians, as you know, spend a portion of their life in aquatic ecosystems and can be greatly impacted by changing environmental conditions. So monitoring these species is, is very similar to fish in that their abundance and health can indicate um, water quality and just overall ecosystem health. So we do spend time tracking these species as well. And going into that a little bit deeper, that first bullet I've just touched on, they live in both terrestrial and aquatic environments and they're just really good indicators of environmental change. Worldwide, they're declining and they're of international concern. So it's something, again, we can overlap with partners on. And really, they're often very abundant and dominate ecosystems in terms of numbers and their total weight, and they're integral parts of food webs. And so with this background in, in mind, um, I wanted to transition a little bit to talk about exactly what we're doing um, in the park to monitor aquatic ecosystems. So our major focus is to monitor and where we can restore aquatic ecosystems. I'd like to introduce here, we have a fish management plan that we finalized in 2018 that really provides a guide for how we monitor and manage native and non-native fish in streams and fish and amphibians in all lakes. Um, you know, the focus is really on brook trout and bull trout in streams and all fish and amphibians in lakes. But, um, you know, the plan not only helps us like frame our work in the park, but it helps us integrate with other planning efforts like the US Fish and Wildlife Service Bull Trout Recovery Plan and help shape our objectives. So we use a variety of methods to accomplish these goals. Um, the first being non-native fish removal, amphibian monitoring, temperature monitoring, uh, dragonfly sampling from mercury, spawning surveys, and kind of a new tool, environmental eDNA as we call it, um, and genetics collection. And I'll briefly touch on these as we move through. So the first being um, non-native fish removal. So we know that fish impact aquatic ecosystems through competition and predation. Um, we also know, which is really cool, when we remove fish, the ecosystem responds quickly. Specifically, in particular, amphibians return both in abundance and in species, and the rest of the ecology starts to respond as well, although at a slower rate for sure. So um, with that in mind, we're focused, again, via the fish management plan on removing fish in 10 lakes focused on brook trout. And these lakes generally have some intersection with bull trout habitat, which is why they were identified as a priority along with the brook trout presence. Um, and we do this, as the pictures indicate, through a variety of methods, gill netting, angling, so just fishing, and also electrofishing. 
The second part of the non-native fish removal is that we're just in the process of updating and finalizing the update of our fishing regulations um, that focus on catch and release of native species and retention and no limits on non-native species. Quickly, just highlighting the two lakes we've been working on these last few years, um, one in the White River watershed, the Littorals, and the other in the Puyallup watershed, LP19, um, named by watershed and just a number. But you can see um, this has been a three-year project, and as soon as fish are removed from these two lakes, we'll move on to the, the next priority of lakes um, identified in the fish management plan. Moving on to the second part, so amphibian and fish monitoring. We talked about the why. Um, you know, results from this monitoring allow us to determine where certain species are present, um, as well as detect any change in presence of observed health or, or habitat as well. And notably and importantly for us as, as those making decisions, it lets us track any response due to any management action we might have taken. So the question is, how? How do we monitor the endless aquatic habitat that we discussed throughout the park? Um, and I'll tell you that the answer is that it's the team effort. The aquatics program generally consists of six to eight people. And we're also tracking additional resources like air quality, visitor use, glacier change. Um, and so we really rely on help and volunteers to spread, to spread the data collection and knowledge of what's going on. Um, We've had to adapt a little bit the last few years because of COVID and we continue to adapt, but essentially our amphibian monitoring program relies on volunteers um, to complete visual surveys, which is walking around the lake, following a protocol, collecting information on amphibian presence, species, overall health. Um, you know, and since, since the beginning of this program in 2009, we've, we've had over 300 volunteers and almost 5,000 volunteer hours collect information. I will say these surveys are typically led by park staff and have two to three to four people involved, but we do have volunteers who conduct both amphibian and fish surveys independently. Um, we provide a um, one to two day training, uh, a list of priority sites and send folks on their way as long as they, they have a comfort level and the knowledge of what's going on. And we've been working really closely with a local angling group in Seattle, the High Lakers. Um, and just as an example, in 2020, they surveyed independently over 29 lakes and wetlands, including some sites that weren't even mapped in the park, which is pretty amazing. So we're continuing to gather information uh, through a wide group of people. Um, recently, we've developed this Survey123 app. Um, it is publicly available and it is a tool to document species in the park. You can download it to your phone. We can provide you with some um, information on identification of species. And as you hike through the park, you can gather information about what you see. On the back end, once it's uploaded, we get a map of points and all the information that's been collected. This is just new. Um, we hope to roll it out this next year. So transitioning a little bit to the direct species observation, I did want to touch a little bit on this on this pretty cool new tool, um, eDNA, um, otherwise known as environmental DNA. And essentially, environmental DNA is the DNA that organisms, all of us, shed into the environment. Um, it is intended or hopefully will help us monitor species distribution in aquatic um, environments around the park. Sources of eDNA include um, skin, fecal matter, and essentially you can grab a water sample um, to, to filter eDNA out of the water column and preserve these samples for lab analysis later. So we have um, a project in 2022 and 2023 to document and collect samples in streams and lakes throughout the park, which will essentially help us identify what's swimming in our park waters. Um, one sample in this particular study is um, designed to sequence up to 30 species. I put this really crazy map on the right um, intentionally, and that's because there's a lot of sample points. Those in green, um, the green circle have already been sampled. 
The other sample points are the um, one kilometer sample design will probably go to five kilometers and target certain watersheds. But you can imagine the intense amount of effort it takes to get to these sites. Um, and this doesn't include lakes yet at this point. But um, you know, with more people and help, um, we can provide the filter system, um, the logistics, the map, and then send you on your way to collect these samples. Um, and we have had there's there's a lot of pre-existing projects that have relied on this method. So we're also planning on collecting fish genetic samples to further understand um, how fish are hybridizing um, and also their distribution in the park. So it's kind of a multi-tiered effort. Uh, I um, am switching back kind of to more of the observational part of the, of the techniques, but really focused on bull trout here. And uh, this, these are our fall red surveys. And so the first question is, what are reds? Um, and essentially, a red is a, a spawning nest made by a female um, in the substrate along the bottom of a river or stream. Um, she'll use her tail to dig a depression, like you can see here, to lay her eggs, and then um, clear a patch of larger rocks to protect them. And you can detect reds with fish. Obviously, this picture on the right has two fish on it, but they're also very easily identified once fish leave. And with that, I wanted to um, share a quick video. This was taken in the fall after we that in the White River watershed um, of the So with this information, um, we can generate these maps. And this is actually a, a really coordinated project with the Puyallup Tribal Fisheries. We could not do it without them. And this was a map generated by them to really identify the hotspots, the habitat that's highly used by, by spawning bull trout. And in addition to that, we can track trends over time. And uh, I put this, this graph up here. This top graph is represents the number of fish by year that have been passed around Mud Mountain Dam. Mud Mountain Dam is one of those trap and haul systems. So it's pretty easy to count the number of adult fish that pass around. And you can see you know, a, an increase starting in 2011. The bottom graph represents the number of reds encountered by year with the blue represented, um, representing the White River watershed and the red, the carbon. And you can see the correspondence. And it really just it helps us track what's going on in the park over time. And of course, this reflects what's going on outside the park. So switching a little bit um, to temperature monitoring and talking a little bit about the habitat. And I've mentioned this quite a bit, but you know, what is the big deal? Like, what is the significance of Mount Rainier? Um, some of the questions we're asking, where are the habitats cold and where are they the coldest? Um, how does that relate to fish habitat use? What areas in the future are going to provide cold habitats? Um, these pictures, I really, they, to me, they they really represent the connection again between glaciers and streams in the park and the running water. Um, and so, to that end, in uh, 2019, we worked with several partners to fly airborne thermal infrared um, imagery throughout the entire Puyallup watershed, um, just to track temperatures on two days in August, essentially. Um, and right away, you can see the cold water of Mount Rainier um, popping out as it warms then downstream. I think notably and really some of the really most important data that came out of that project is this right-hand map, which, which shows um, the difference of water temperature in a really small area. And so the blue, which is about 11 degrees Celsius, is a cold water spring or hyperreic zone um, that's surrounded by much warmer water. And we know these areas are critical throughout the watershed for aquatic resources. And so we're getting a good understanding of, of where these are distributed. Um, on the left, I have, picture, I have a picture of all the temperature loggers we currently have out. And we're working on a couple projects with USGS to model future conditions using a variety of climate models um, to tie in, to try and figure out how temperatures are going to change and then how that might impact resources in the park. 
This is a, a little bit of a tangent, but also relevant because it's another volunteer-based program. And this is the Dragonfly Mercury Project. Um, it is a nationwide partnership, which also makes it really significant, um, but it's between the National Park Service, the USGS and uh, University of Maine. And as part of the program, dragonflies are collected um, and sent off to be analyzed for mercury. Um, dragonfly live for almost nine years in water and they're good indicators of mercury in the, in the water. So from the results, we can get um, an idea of mercury throughout the park in aquatic ecosystems. Um, and I would say really a unique program in that it is nationwide. And so we can compare across the whole landscape um, of this program. And at Mount Rainier, we have found a really wide variety of mercury concentrations in the park, um, but you can see that lower graph all the way up to 500 parts per billion. The dot in light represents 300 parts per billion, above which is a concern um, for human and uh, wildlife consumption. So still trying to understand how and where mercury is um, deposited and then bioaccumulates, but notably uh, the result of volunteer support over time. So I wanted at this point, um, I know we were gonna throw up a poll. I was just thinking about these programs I described. So we've got amphibian monitoring, fish and angling, um, the dragonfly mercury survey, eDNA sample collection. And I'm just curious from those that are attending, what, what interests you most? And truthfully, this, the results help us shape our field season and where we put our effort. So um, I am, I'm curious about your feedback. And these, these will continue to evolve uh, again because of COVID, but also um, depending on the amount of staff support and the amount of interest. We'll just give it a few more minutes. Awesome, so pretty equally distributed. Good to know. Thanks, Casey. Um, and then, Stop sharing, sharing again, it froze up for just one moment. So give me a minute here. There we go. So the last thing I wanted to highlight that's actually really relevant right now, um, first is that we just recently finished a Mount Rainier National Park Fishing Regulation pamphlet. It's available online through the Mount Rainier website, but it's also going to be available in like put your hands on format um, when you enter the park. It's got a lot of information in it and includes the updating fishing regulations as well, which currently are um, open for public review in the federal register. Um, and I just went to see how easy it is to access them, but honestly, federalregister.gov in a search for Mount Rainier puts you to um, the rule change, provides the, the background, the why and the where, and then allows you to make a comment. And so if you're interested in that and learning more, please go visit that. And it also is an opportunity for us to interact with the public and, uh, and get feedback. So please consider that as well. And then with that, um, just kind of summarizing it and looking into the future, the first thing on the bullet is this more re robust eDNA sampling, um, focused genetic sampling as well. So for you anglers, um, this is the project. Continued non-native fish removal. Um, we hope to finalize the updated fishing regulations, regulations once this federal rule closes um, and we receive the feedback and have some back and forth. And then finally, this expanded citizen science or continued, I should say, that continues to evolve um, through amphibian surveys, angling surveys. I know Matt has goals of putting on a fishing derby 
um, the dragonfly mercury sampling and then eDNA sampling. So with that, I know that we had um, one video that we wanted to share that, um, that was captured by Mitch Pittman when he joined three of the aquatics crew out in the field for a day of spawning surveys. Mount Rainier just has a lot of the that, you know, headwater critical habitat that the bull trout rely on. So we start like a week before we'd expect them to come up. So we have like a baseline and we can gather data. Like right now we see fish in the river, in the lower part of the river, but not like higher up in the system. As we go on and survey these streams every week, we can kind of see where the fish are moving, when they start to dig their reds and when they're leaving. So we have like a whole picture of their spawning season. And we have these like GIS maps for plotting it all in. So we can kind of like watch the points as they move up the map, see where they're spawning. And we get like a whole map of bull trout activity in the park, which is so cool. Really looking at that mound, it's, it's a, all it is is just life being spread for miles. I mean, what is water except other than a, a, a the factor of supporting life and even this river right here is being spread from that mountain for miles and being able to conserve all this majestic biodiversity that all of this water provides really water systems are just so essential to a, a host of animals and wildlife and plants and just being here and being able to protect that stuff conserve it and really learn more about it the the unknowns and how better we can manage it is it means the world to me really <laughs> Awesome, thank you. And I'm uh, here, Matt and I are both here for any questions or more, more detail that you may want. Uh, thank you, Rebecca and Matt, thank you for the work that you do. And we are gonna have some questions. Some folks have sent them to me prior to this, wanting to make sure that this these got registered. And, um, <clears throat> Just a reminder, everyone, we do record these and that it will be posted to our website tomorrow. I want to start off by asking you, Matt, tell us about your dreams for fishing derby. Yeah, um, I think as we kind of developed that uh, survey one, two, three um, project with the uh, toad sightings, I'm hoping to, you know, use the lessons learned from that and um, kind of expand um, and kind of give a, a really broad opportunity for lots of different people to get involved and um, use that as a, a tool to, um, again, expand our overall effort and then um, our different locations too. Great, sounds good. And we did include an art, a link to an article about survey one, two, three that's going on over at Glacier. So that's in the chat box for folks. I know that, um, I know that a number of people who are with us today have actually supported this program through Washington's National Park Fund. So they're wondering, they wanna hear from you, how do you invest the money that we give, that, that we collectively give? How is this it invested? Is, this is great. So I always, it is always very challenging to try and describe the significance of the contributions from Washington's National Parks Fund. And so, I was trying to frame it like I mentioned this all started our strategy around the development of this fish management plan in 2018. And like with any plan, whether you're building a house or you're going on a trip, you have the plan and then it's, well, how are we going to pay for it? Um, I think some people would go about it the other way. But regardless, we had the plan first. And then we finished the plan, which was a monumental effort. And uh, it's like, okay, how are we gonna pay for this? And the very first contribution we had to support the work came through the Washington's National Parks Fund. With those funds, this was the first year, we were able to match those funds um, and then continue to build. So the staff that you see that are working on this project, the supplies that you see, the ability to, to coordinate the outreach to get the work done, um, is, is supported through these funds. And I would just say that it, like, I won't, I hope that just describes the significance. Those of you that plan, you know, you need that first little egg and then you can just build on. And that's 
that's what it's done for this program. It's been huge. Thank you, Rebecca. Matt, anything you want to add to that? No, yeah, that summed it up perfectly. Really appreciate it for all your guys' help. We're happy to do it, all of us, everybody who's with us today. I'm going to go to some questions in the chat box and see what we're seeing. Um, and while I'm going through that, I will ask, <clears throat> you talked about volunteers and the impact and the need. How do folks go about getting involved? What, what do they need to do? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of ways to do that. It's the to contact me directly. And then depending on the interest, whether it's amphibians or fish or mercury, um, I then put you in contact with the main crew lead and then it becomes a very one-on-one -on -one personal information um, gathering two-way street. The second way is Kevin Bacher and the volunteer program. Whenever you put a volunteer request in or an interest, that program you know, really looks into what the interests are and then I will get your contact information and then we'll circle back to you that way. So really two avenues, direct or through the volunteer program. Great. And if people, you know, want to reach out to you, will we have your email on at the end or do you want to reel it off real quick? Uh, sure, I will reel it off if you don't mind. So it's Please Rebecca, Rebecca R-E-B-E-C-C-A underscore A underscore Lofgren, it's L-O-F-G-R-E-N at NPS.gov. Thank you. Yeah. And if folks need that again, they can reach out to us. Great. I have a question. Um, this person says they may have missed what was said, but regarding the Dragonfly Mercury project, are the adults collected as well as larva? And uh, what kind of numbers are collected per year at Mount Rainier National Park? Sure, so the larva are what are in the aquatic ecosystem, so not the adults that are flying. The larva, and they actually live in that stage for up to nine years, which is why they're such good indicators of mercury in the environment. And the second question was, so we generally, um, every year we've been monitoring three sites and we've been trying to keep two, at least one of the sites the same to track trends over time and then moving the other two sites around throughout the park. And it's one of the reasons why we have a good spatial distribution of mercury throughout the park, which as I mentioned, really ranges a lot from really low to, to above, um, you know, the level at which we'd be concerned with um, impacts mainly to wildlife. So, thank you. Uh, do, does all the volunteerism, all the work that the volunteers do with you, is it, you know, what elevation are folks at? Ah, that's a, ah. yeah, of course. So this is, this is part of the strategy of the volunteer program is that through all these different programs, um, there are sites all over the park. So elevations range from um, 2,500 up to, I would say 6,500, but sites can be right off the road, or if you really want an adventure, we can send you on an adventure. Um, but it's really targeted towards what your interest is, whether it's a day trip, whether it's an overnight trip. Um, and that's part of the one-on-one -on -one that happens with the crew lead after you get in contact with us. So those, those details and nuances are, are worked out. Thank you. Um, I have a, a, you know, kind of a layperson question here. I see on the site where fishing is allowed for uh, one hour before sunset, no sunrise, excuse me, and one hour after sunset. What What is that about? So that's mainly in streams. Matt, Matt do you wanna take that one or? I'll go ahead and uh, defer yeah. to you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. So that has to do um, with spawning fish in, in the park and so, the focus on streams is on catch and release of native species. And so the target is to do it during daylight hours. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks, Rebecca. <clears throat> um, and I find, find it fascinating when you say to us, and folks, if you have questions, feel free to add them into the Q&A or the chat box. We're monitoring both. Um, I just find it fascinating about stocking, how they used to stock the lakes and um, brook trout. And you said, I think I got this, historically, the lakes and streams were fishless. So lakes were historically fishless. Um, streams definitely had fish in them, although, you know, not a lot. And so that is, is one of the interesting parts when we think about managing fish and streams, because, you know, they stopped rainbow fish and um, rainbow fish are native also uh, 
to the Pacific Northwest, and then stocked also a variety of different types of trout that have gen, then gone on to hybridize with native fish. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's a puzzle to figure out what's in our, our park waters and um, strategies and impacts really. So. Certainly is. Matt, yeah. anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I always like to think a bit of uh, how connected all these different bodies of water is too. Um, a lot of these lakes are, you know, high alpine lakes. You know, they're pretty isolated systems. So, to uh, like Rebecca was mentioning and uh, alluding to earlier, you know, to add in a, a top predator into these isolated systems can really have uh, dire consequences. So, just trying to manage, you know, having opportunities for recreation, but then also um, conservation as our uh, forefront too. Thank you both, I appreciate it. Um, how will the availability of the survey one, two, three be announced? How can folks learn more about that? Yeah, and that's, like I said, this was a new app that actually Creston, who was in the video, developed and targeted towards one species. And we'll be further working on that this spring. And we'll, we don't have a way yet to announce that, but we will. It'll be, you know, either through social media or a resource brief, or we'll, we'll figure out a way to get that information out to people. And certainly, Lori, work with the Washington's National Parks Fund to do that as well. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, if, here's a question. If you're encouraging fishing for non-native fish, does that mean we can keep the fish or is it strictly catch and release? Common so question, in, I'm sure. In lakes, you can go crazy. Please keep all the fish you want. Um, there's no limit, no time limit. Um, and then in streams, it's, it's catch and release of native fish species, um, which again is all clearly defined in the fishing pamphlet on what that is. So it's really, if you wanna think about it in a really simple way, um, we just want you to keep the brook trout in the streams that you catch and everything else you should release. Thank yeah. you. And one last question. Um, one of you was asking about um, how many are with us today? And we have 32 folks online with, uh, which, uh, with us, which is great turnout. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Yeah. With that, um, we're just gonna begin to close and say to Matt and to Rebecca, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. You know, um, it really is our privilege at Washington's National Park Fund to work with terrific folks like you. Um, and you see on the screen here this past year, we had our best year ever. Every year we're raising more and it's because people care so deeply and they discover Washington's National Park Fund and they realize they can give their gifts directly to programs. And the four areas that you see on your screen, everyone, those are the areas that, that we um, invest in. And Rebecca and Matt's program, this program today is uh, focused in on science and research. Um, uh, you know, almost all of these because we know families are involved. It expands volunteerism and stewardship and certainly improves visitors' experiences. And with that, we are right at the mark. Shelly, you're welcome. Everyone, thank you so much. Michael, thank you. We're with, glad you're with us today. Thanks, everyone. Reach out. If you have questions, you know, we'll get the answers for you. Um, have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, guys.